Welcome to Unit 12, Module 67. Today we're talking about mood disorders. Here are your learning objectives and here is your vocab. So mood disorders, that's an umbrella term for any psychological disorder that's characterized by emotional extremes. So we're going to be talking about major depressive disorder. Depression is feelings of deep discouragement about the future, having trouble sleeping or a change in sleeping habits, in eating habits, a lack of energy, an inability to concentrate, feeling socially isolated. All of those things are symptoms of depression. 29% of American high school students said they felt sad or hopeless almost every day for two or more weeks, and they stopped doing some of their usual activities. 31% of college students said the same. Depression is the number one reason that people seek mental health services, and depression is the leading cause of disability. So major depressive disorder is when a person experiences in the absence of drugs or some other substance abuse two or more weeks with five or more symptoms, and at least one of the symptoms has to be a depressed mood or a loss of interest and pleasure. And so over on the right here, you'll see a list of the possible symptoms that we're talking about. So they have to have five of those and these symptoms must be severe enough that they cause near daily distress or impairment. And again, this isn't something that you can just read this list and someone can say, oh yeah, that I'm quali I, that qualifies me or whatever. The It is important to note the clinical significance of these things and um, work with someone who is knowledgeable and experienced in this area. So persistent depressive disorder, or also known as dysthymia, they experience mildly depressed symptoms for at least two years, and they display two of the following symptoms. So regulation of appetite or having sleep issues, low energy, low self-esteem, difficulty concentrating and making decisions and feeling. Bipolar disorder is where a person alternates between the hopelessness and lethargy of depression and the overexcited state of mania. This is not a moment to moment um, or day to day thing. This is more week to week changes. Um, a lot of people misinterpret the idea that someone could be bipolar and you think that you see those symptoms because one moment they're happy about something and another moment they're sad about something. That is not what bipolar looks like. So what is mania? We've just talked about what depression looks like. So that would be the one end of bipolar. The other end is mania. And this is a mood disorder that is marked by hyperactive or very optimistic state. Um, in and it's so optimistic that it's risky and it's unhealthy, unsafe. So they could be very over talkative and you can't really get any words in. They're easily irritated, likely do not sleep very much at all. They're talking fast. It's not necessarily making sense. They are less sexually inhibited. And actually that's, um, they're, they're very at risk for um, STDs or some other issue because of the um, overly optimistic and risky behaviors that they're leaning towards in this time. So there are two types of bipolar. Bipolar one is the classic conditions, what I've just described. So they'd have a major depressive episode and they'd also have um, time periods of mania. And bipolar two is the milder version where the patient has at least one episode of hypomania. So that's an elevated mood without psychosis. So it's, it's um, less severe than a full-blown manic episode with bipolar one. And they still have the major depressive episodes and those can still be just as severe. In milder forms, it does correlate to creativity and there's many accounts um, of composers, artists, poets, novelists, all of these people who have these creative bouts um, who also had a diagnosis of bipolar. 
So there's something called disrupt disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, and this is actually a new diagnosis in the DSM-5, which came out in 2013. And there were so many children and young people being diagnosed with bipolar and being given medication that they felt like there was something unique about the circumstances of childhood and adolescence enough to um, give it a separate label. So disruptive mood dysregulation disorder occurs in childhood and adolescence, and it's marked with extreme irritability, anger, and frequent intense temper outbursts. And so you can look at the chart down there and kind of see some differences between DMDD and bipolar. So let's try to understand, step back and look at the big picture of mood disorders. So depression is widespread across all cultures. So it's not culture bound. Some cultures have more reported cases than others, of course. Major depressive episodes um, so, tend to self-terminate, meaning someone will might never go to therapy and eventually their major depressive episodes will leave. However, therapy helps and tends to speed recovery. It can also prevent future episodes from occurring. For about half of the people who have a major depressive episode, it reoccurs at some point. And the more support one receives, the less the length of the depressive episode and the older they are when it first occurs, the less likely they are to experience a depressive episode again. Stressful events are the trigger to depression, but obviously, like we've talked about before, and if you look at this chart on the right, we know that disorders are biopsychosocial, as are most everything we're talking about in psychology. So there's genetic predispositions, there's your um, psychological influences, the way you think, your explanatory style, and then there's also the trigger, the outside environmental trigger, or the social cultural influence. Women are at double risk, and we'll talk about this more in a little bit, and depression is striking in younger and younger um, teens, and the highest rates are in developed countries, and we'll talk about maybe why, some possible reasons why, in a minute, and teens are increasingly more willing to disclose depression, so that also might increase the numbers. So let's look at it from a biological perspective. So um, depression and mood disorders are genetic. If an identical twin gets major depressive disorder, there's a one in two chance that the other identical twin will. Now you might say, well, wouldn't they both have it if they're identical twins and it's genetic? However, remember that part, the biopsychosocial part. So the bio is just one component, but it does severely increase their chances. Um, and the same thing goes for bipolar, 7 in 10 chance. Research has found that major depressive disorder is 37% heritable. So remember, heritability is the extent to which individual differences are attributed to genes. So we can't look at one person, but when we look at the whole human species, we can say that it's 37% likely due to genetics as a whole species. Um, we see diminished brain activity when we looked at the, at the depressed brain. They've also noted 7% smaller frontal lobes in those who have severe depression. Um, there's also differences in the brain structure of those with bipolar. We know that norepinephrine is lower in depressed brains and in overabundance. Too much norepinephrine is seen in a manic brain. You can see pictures of um, a PET scan over there on the right um, with bipolar. And then research also has more recently indicated that serotonin plays an important role in depression. So obviously drugs related to these new two neurotransmitters go along with helping treatment. And we'll talk about that more in the treatment unit. So there are also other factors like um, eating a healthy Mediterranean diet, um, exercising can reduce re depression. So there's a bunch of other things. So basically a healthy heart also helps a healthy mind. 
So mood disorders from the social cognitive perspective. So remember, this is looking at the environment, the situations, and the personality. So depressed people view life through a negative explanatory style. And this is really important to the social cognitive perspective. So they're going to look at how you handle those stressors. So something bad happens to someone with a negative explanatory style, they're going to magnify those bad situations and minimize the good. And this can lead to feelings of learned helplessness. So remember, learned helplessness is where some um, uncontrollable bad event occurs and there's a perceived lack of control. And so the more a depressed person feels a lack of control, the less they're going to try to change anything or believe anything can change. And that just pushes that cycle of depression further. It is more common in women than men, that learned helplessness factor. And remember, we already said that depression is more common in women than men. And women may respond more strongly to stress. This, so this could explain that whole thing about why women are more prone. People with depression tend to ruminate. And what that means, they get kind of stuck where they can't stop overthinking all of the possibilities of the problem, but not really like, it's not useful thought. They're not getting anywhere. They're just constantly thinking about it. Um, and they're overwhelmed by those thoughts. Women tend to ruminate more than men. So again, another factor that makes women more at risk. So here's a look at the negative explanatory style for someone with depression. So a stressor occurs. So there's a breakup and the person looks at it as stable. How they feel is stable. It is not changing. I will never get over this. will never get better. It's stuck there. It is global. Without that person, without my partner, I can't seem to do anything right. So everything's wrong, not just that one thing. And then internal means that it was their fault. Like everything that's bad is my fault. So it's not going to change. It applies to everything in my life and it's all my fault. So that kind of style, and that's just like one event, but imagine this person goes throughout their day and they always look at things this way, as stable, as global, and as internal. A more healthy coping style would be to look at it as temporary. I feel really bad right now, but I'm going to feel better soon. It's to look at the situation as specific. I really miss that person, but I do have these other things in my life. And it's external. You know, it wasn't meant to be. It's not just me. It takes two, right? So, um, again, stable, global, and internal for explanatory style. Martin Sligman, um, positive psychology, he contends that depression is more common in Westerners because of that individualist uh, mentality. So remember, we talked about individualist cultures versus collectivist cultures. He's saying individualist cultures actually put people more at risk for depression because all the failures become more internal. Everything that goes wrong is more your fault. Whereas in non-Western cultures, it's more of a cooperative um, thing. It's more um, like you have more uh, cooperation in anything you do. So you look at the problem, the failures as more of a cooperative failure, not just just on you. Um, in Japan, in cases of depression, people feel more depressed for letting other people down than for that self-blame that we just explained. So researchers also find that those who are depressed actually induce hostility in others, induce depress depressive feelings in others, and create anxiety. Um, so it's kind of this negative cycle that they're stuck in. They have a stressful experience. 
they have that negative explanatory style that we talked about that leads to the press mood. And then those thoughts and behavior changes lead to more problems. So people with depression are more likely to um, get uh, a divorce or lose their job or um, do unhealthy things that might put them at health risk. Like there's a cycle that they're kind of spiraling down. And we all do this a little bit in terms of like something bad happens and we have those times of everything's bad. Um, we um, see things more negative in that moment. But again, remember, we're talking about clinically significant symptoms. So what are our takeaways? Remember that depression is the number one reason that people seek, seek mental health care and it is not, depression is not culture bound. It happens everywhere, but it's more um, common in individualism cultures than collectivist cultures. Persistent depressive disorder is a milder um, depression and it must be present for two or more years. There's two types of bipolar. Bipolar one is the classic type and then bipolar two has hypomania and it still has those major depressive disorders. We know that genetics plays an important role in our risk factor for having um, depression. Now, that doesn't mean that if you have the genes for depression, you will get depression. It just puts you at higher risk because remember, it's biopsychosocial. Not all those identical twins are gonna develop depression but they just have a higher risk. We know that there's differences in the brain structure. We know that there are neurotransmitter differences, norepinephrine, too much can lead to episodes of mania and too little depression. Serotonin is also important for depression. And when we look at that social cognitive perspective in mood disorders, we know that the explanatory style is an important component and can lead to that cycle of stressful events and negative negative explanatory styles. So that sums up module 67 and I will see you in class. Thanks guys.